Welcome to our Bible study for this week. We are looking at the names of God, various names that were given to him by the prophets and others. And today we're looking at the name of righteousness, that God is a righteous God. It is a title that uh, is uh, kind of difficult to describe sometimes. It's difficult. It's kind of abstract. Exactly what is righteousness? What does that mean? Righteousness means doing the right thing. So when you look around in today's headlines and you see what's going on in politics and in business and in in everything, in your neighborhood, in your family, you find that there are, is a lot of unrighteousness that's going on, which means people are not always doing the right thing, yourself including and myself included. So we don't do the right thing. God does the right thing. God is righteous. He gives us the example of a righteous God. Righteous is something that's very important for a society to hold itself together. Whenever you look at societies that collapse, countries that collapse, etc., it's because there are people who are unrighteous that are running things or that people are narcissistic and they want everything else and they don't care about what happens to other people. God is not like that. God is a righteous God. And so we're going to look at some of the ways that he dealt with his people in this idea of being righteous. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for our study today. Thank you for a righteous God who loves us and has mercy upon us, cares about us, and gives us hope in a time and in a land where hope seems in the future or at a far distance. But we thank you, Lord, that as we study together, we find that your prophet Jeremiah and some of your disciples give us hope that justice will not be served because if justice is served, we all will be doomed, but instead your righteousness will be served. We thank you, Lord, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn with me to um, uh, Jeremiah or uh, and it's uh, chapter 23. Now, Jeremiah is prophesying at a time when Israel has fallen. That's the northern kingdoms, the ten northern tribes. And the southern tribes are about ready to be uh, annihilated. Uh, Assyria destroyed the northern kingdoms. We talked about that last week or the week before. And this week, we're going to see that the two southern kingdoms are going to be destroyed. Our southern two southern tribes are going to be destroyed by a by Babylon, and all the people are going to be carried into captivity. Now, that's a um, a far cry from the covenant that God made with Abraham, where He said, "I'll take care of you," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people think that it was an unconditional covenant. And uh, I went through the Bible and looked at this covenant, and I saw that there were uh, there was one case where it seemed to be unconditional, that no matter what Israel did, they would be taken care of by God. But most of the times the covenant is talked about, it is conditional upon the fact that Israel, that God's people, Jacob, whatever you want to call it, will respond to God's covenant by obeying him. And that's when they get into trouble, when they fall out from God and look into themselves and don't obey God. So to me, this covenant is not a unconditional covenant that God made. It is a covenant that's based upon the condition that God will take care of us. God will watch after us. God will take care of Israel. He will take care of the tribes if they remain faithful to him and worship him and put him first. But they didn't do that. And so we see what's going on here. They've been captured and, and destroyed and pushed out of their countries and, and to, you know, to, to no longer really have a place to call home uh, until 48 or so when Israel came back and instituted some of their uh, property, etc. And it's been nothing but chaos and problems and difficulty since then with the Palestinians. And we can go into all that, but there's no point in, in, in checking on, on any of that right now. Um, and there's different viewpoints about that. The, the point is 
that Israel has never has never been as strong as it was during the time of David, has never been as strong as it was during the times of Solomon, when people were obeying God and following Him and watching, uh, and and listening to His voice and doing what it was that He wanted them to do, when they were keeping the covenant. But now they decided that that's not that important, and they did their own thing, and they faced the consequences. Not that God was punishing them necessarily, but they were bringing all of this abuse upon themselves by not doing what God had uh, called them to do and asked them to do. Okay, so so if you look at Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6, it's a time of, of darkness. Uh, like I say, the northern tribes have been destroyed. The southern tribes are about ready to be destroyed. destroyed. Jeremiah is about ready to end his uh, job as being a prophet. He's been prophet for many, many years. Um, he's about ready to give that up because of his age, etc. And Ezekiel will take over. He prophesied in Babylon when they were taken into captivity. But right now we're looking at Jeremiah and we're looking at his uh, prophecies. Now, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because he saw things so bad and he was correct that he would weep. He would cry and wail and he would you know, always have a message of doom. Now, you had other prophets that had messages of, of hope, messages of trust, messages that told the people everything is going to be fine. Just do what you're doing and everything's going to be great. And those were called false prophets. But false prophets were those that people liked. Uh, they, uh, you know, in, in many times they were in the courts that the kings would pay to keep them saying what it was that they wanted them to say. It was kind of like taking the, the press or taking the uh, news people and telling them what they must say. Like during Nazi Germany, they took over all the communications that the news people have with the people and put on their own radio stations, etc. And that's all the people could get. So all they heard were lies day after day, day in, day out. And finally, that's all that they knew. That's all that they believed. But Jeremiah was a prophet that stood against these false prophets. And uh, he wasn't very popular because of it. And he was looked down upon, etc. And it's not really until the Bible was brought to us that we see the importance of Jeremiah, and we give him, in 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 retrospect, the the uh, respect that he needs, uh, and that that he deserved, I should say, because he did and said the right thing, and was not afraid to proclaim the truth, as bad as it was. And so he says, "So look, the days are coming." This is the Lord's declaration. When I will raise up a righteous branch for David. So, so Jeremiah has some good news. And he's saying, you know, things are bad. You remember the time of David? You remember how good David was? He was a great king. He had a lot of problems, but he was a great king overall. And he said, I'm going to raise up a branch. A branch from David. That's what I'm going to do. That's what God said that he's going to do. And people would understand that. They would be very happy about that. He will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. So this branch that's going to be raised up from the line of David is not going to be like a regular ruler or king. But this ruler or king is going to judge and rule with justice. And he's going to be wise. And he's going to be righteous. He's going to be wise He's going to be just and he's going to be righteous. Now, have you ever known of a politician that was wise? Well, maybe some uh, was uh, just was was justice that that dealt out justice the way that it should be was totally fair. That looked at both sides equally. I say both sides, both parties or, or people without respect to where they came from. Um, have you ever known of a politician who was wise, as I already said? Who was who dealt, who served justice equally and fairly, uh, and was righteous? Who did the right thing? Well, if you know any politician like that, let me know because I don't know any politician like that. In fact, if you know any person like that, let me know because there's no person like that. None of us are perfect, and we all make mistakes, and none of us are, uh, you know, you know, look at things clearly the way that God looks at things and the way that Jesus taught. We do the best we can, but we fall short. And so Jeremiah is saying, we're gonna have a king that's gonna come along and he's going to do all these things. Wow, that, that is great news. 
He will reign wisely as king and a minister of justice and righteousness. Wouldn't that be great if we had a president who would do that? I don't think we've ever had a president like that. We've had some very, very good presidents, but none of them did, did all this. In his days, Judah will be saved. Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. Judah and Israel, Judah, the two southern tribes, Israel, the 10 northern tribes, they're not, they're not stable. They're not uh, safe. They are not secure. They have just been defeated. They've just been hauled off as slaves to other countries. Uh, not Judah yet, but they will be shortly. Uh, so so it's they're, they're not secure. Yet in this time, when this new king comes along, they will be secure. This is the name he will be called. The Lord is our righteous. So that's what he's going to be called. Now, righteous means doing the right thing. Righteous is somebody who does the right thing. If you say somebody's righteous, it means that they you know, are doing the correct thing. They are looking at things through the eyes of God, and they want to make right all the things that they possibly can. Now, we come up with the term self-righteous, which, uh, unfortunately, we uh, you know have, have that, and, and, and it's thrown into play. Self-righteous, of course, means that you have gone beyond righteous, and you're looking at yourself as being righteous and patting yourself on the back. It's a good thing to do something good for somebody or to do something good in general. Uh, but then it's another thing to pat your own back. People don't like braggarts usually. Uh, they like uh, people who get the job done with it, without fanfare. They just go about doing what it is that's best for other people, uh, best for uh, the Lord's work. And they just go about quietly getting it done. Uh, that's why most preachers who have, who who operate that way without much fanfare, that are humble, uh, that just go about doing God's work, don't expect anything in return, never get into large churches. People like big mouths. People like people who uh, are full of bravado. Look what I'm doing. Look how great I am. Uh, great preacher, great orator, etc. There's nothing wrong with that. You know that's wonderful. But when you look, and we've talked about these uh, fake preachers that make millions and millions of dollars, um, and we look at that, and people cannot wait to give money to them because they are drawn in by their bravado, by their uh, great speaking voices, by their smiles, by their false gospels. I mean, nobody wants to hear that we're sinners and that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us of our sins. No, we want to hear things like we're wonderful, we are created in God's likeness, and we have the whole world in front of us with total and great possibilities. We can achieve anything we want to. And the more money we give, the more success we're gonna have. That's that's what people like to hear. Um, and it's it, it's all, you know, not, not soundly based on the scriptures. Um, but but that's, that's unfortunately, that's what goes on. So we have righteous, we have a righteous king that's going to come and take care of Israel and going to take care of Judah, going to take care of his people. Uh, turn with me now to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Now, Paul is talking here. He wrote Romans, and he says, There is no one righteous, not even one, which is what we've been talking about. There's not a Jew that's righteous. There's not a Gentile, which is a non-Jew, that's righteous. No one is righteous. Paul looked out over the, the vast seas of people, and he said, There's nobody righteous, and Paul would include himself in that. He was always the first one to take himself down. He says, there is, verse 11, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Nobody understands what it means to be righteous. There's nobody that understands how to be righteous because we are so uh, turned into ourselves and we are so decrepit that there's no hope for us. We don't even know where to look. We don't even know where the light is or what the light does. We don't know what to search for because we don't even have the guidelines. We don't even have the book. These people didn't, didn't, didn't have the book that would tell them what the right guidelines were. They had the Old Testament. They talked about different prophets that would shed light on who was coming, just like these verses here. Isaiah had a lot of verses about the, the Messiah that was to come. And the people, even the Jewish population, believed in the Messiah, that God was going to return again. Uh, the problem was when Jesus came back and declared himself to be Messiah, that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for a earthly king, 
uh, somebody that was going to take over the, the world and defeat the Romans and put the uh, Jews first, number one. But that's not the way it turned out. And so when Jesus came and proclaimed the gospel that he didn't come to do what all the other nations do, fight each other and try to get more property, more territory, more money than anybody else. Jesus said, that's not why I'm here. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of the Father. And instead, let me tell you what it's about. And he gave us the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the humble. You know, blessed, totally different than what other people would say is really important. Um, and so, so there was no one who was seeking God because they didn't really know what God was like. You know, if you look at the Old Testament and that's all you go by, you don't know what God's like. You get some, some understanding of him, but you get, it's a hodgepodge of different ideas, etc. Why do you think God sent Jesus to show us what he's like? We, we were confused. We didn't know for sure how things worked out. We had these elaborate sacrifices that we did for God and, and, and to God. Uh, we have, um, you, you know, a lot of laws uh, that, that condemned us all to hell. We had the Ten Commandments, which are good things, but you can't get, you can't go to heaven because you keep the Ten Commandments. You can't be righteous because you keep the Ten Commandments because nobody keeps them all. If you kept all the Ten Commandments and never broke them, you wouldn't need Jesus because you would be sinless and you wouldn't need him. But we know that's not possible. We all break the commandments and that's what they were there for, really, not only to make society a better place in which to live, but to show us that we're not perfect and that we're not going to be able to do and to, to, to uh, what, what would I say, to, um, to make ourselves righteous to where we can get to heaven on our own. It's going to take more than that. And that's why God sent Jesus to show us and to tell us what God is really like. And so Paul said, no, nobody knows. No, it, you know, he, he said, nobody seeks God. They don't understand who, who he is or what he is or anything else. Uh, verse 12, all have turned away. We've all turned away. Uh, we're all alike and we've all become worthless. So Paul, you know, he put it right, right on the... Um, uh, right on the table. It's it's that's not a popular thing to say that you know you're you're sinners. You're not worth anything. You're nothing but scum, and you have no hope because you have you are not righteous. You don't care about God. You don't care about people. You don't care about anybody. We don't like to hear that, and that's what Paul basically said. He says we have we have become worthless. Worthless. We can't get by with any. We can't get anything done. Um, and then moving on, verse 12, uh, verse 12, there is no one who does what is good, not even one. So Paul said, boy, it's a pretty bad world here. But it's the same thing Jeremiah was preaching. And he's saying, no, you people, you've let God down. He made this covenant with you and you haven't kept your side of the bargain at all. You haven't done anything. You have been obedient for a while and things went fairly good. And then you became disobedient and started worshiping other gods and doing your own thing. And all these things fell in on you. Um, Verse 13, he says, their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. So Paul is saying here that we uh, are, are, are like our, uh, our throat's like an open grave. You know, there's nothing in there except death and stench and, and rotten bones. There's, there's, there's nothing there. It's empty except for the, uh, for the, um, the deteriorating material that's there that stinks and causes decay and corruption. Um, we we deceive with our tongues. You know, we are not, you know, we lie. We do what we want to do. Nobody knows what the truth is. Everybody's doing their own thing. And it's very hard to know what the truth really is. You know, if you lie enough, everybody will start to believe that lie. That's what they said about Hitler. They said he told enough lies enough times that people started to believe it and did believe it and ended up being a, uh, a nation of savage people who, who, you know, destroyed six million Jews. Now, not everybody was guilty of that, but a lot of people were guilty of that. Not just the, not just the leaders of Germany, but other people that that came down to and that were racist and, and that, you know, saw that as a good thing, even if they didn't do it themselves, they were for it, they were behind it. And that's what Paul's saying. You know, it's a whole nation that has, that's corrupted, that, that doesn't see the truth. 
um, they're 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 t they're liars. They're a bunch of liars. Their their uh, lies are like venom from snakes. It causes poison. Causes people to be hurt and crippled, and it kills them. Okay, so that that's a pretty bad scenario of humanity. Uh, and then uh, Romans three twenty one twenty six, Paul goes on to say, but now. So things have changed. But now, you know, Paul had to get their attention on how bad they were before they could hear on what is possible in their sad, bad state. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. So now Paul says, but now look, you people are all going to hell. God has judged you because you have done all these things and not one of you is right. There's not one in here that's righteous. You're all going to hell if you live under the law. If you live by the rules of the Old Testament, there's no hope for you because nobody can keep the laws. So Paul says, but now look, apart from the law, there's, there's another way. The righteousness of God has been revealed attested by the law and prophets. He says, now look, the, 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 even in the Old Testament, the prophets like Jeremiah was telling you, like Isaiah was attesting to the fact that God was going to send somebody who was going to make sense out of your corrupt nature and give you hope in a dying world. You corrupted, despicable person. God still loves you and he's going to help take care of your condition. Verse 22, and it's not going to be through the law because that the, the, the law condemns us, but Jesus Christ saves us. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. So there you go. Paul says, but you know, if you believe in Christ, then you there, there's hope for you. Now, when he says belief, the word belief is not just a passive, yes, I believe, I read the story, and I believe that there's such thing as Jesus, I believe there's Santa Claus, I believe, you know, that there's this and that. No, it is a active accepting of Christ in your life that changes your life. Now, we're not going to be sinless all of a sudden, but we're going to be mindful of our sins. We're going to be more forgiving. We're going to be loving. We're going to be more compassionate. And you say, well, no, that's not true. I don't feel that way. Well, then probably you're not a Christian. You, 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 you know, let, let's face it, Jesus laid that out, and that's what he said, that you, that, that, that's, that's what's going to happen to you. You don't have to do that in order to be a Christian. You will do that because you are a Christian. If you don't do that, you're not a Christian. You haven't been changed. So that's what Paul is saying, and that's what God says to you. That's what the Holy Spirit says to all of us. If you want to really be saved and really know that you are a Christian, your soul and your life and your spirit and your mindset will change to where you no longer put yourself first, but you put God first. And when you put God first, then you put everybody else under God, but before yourself. That's just the way, that's just the way that the Christian life works. Does that mean then that if you still are unforgiving or that you still sin or you don't do what you should do, that's that you're not a Christian? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that you should feel guilty when you don't live up to what God wants you to do. You should you should f feel guilty. I mean, uh, good grief! You know, God God uh, passes out justice, uh, but it's really not justice. Um, it's really not righteousness. If it was, we'd all go to hell. Instead, it's mercy. Paul said God treats you with mercy, not what you deserve, but what He's going to give you. These are really some great words from Paul here. If you ever start, you know, feeling kind of down and that you're worthless, read these and see what kind of God that you really do serve. Uh, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. So he talks about the mercy seat here. The mercy seat was a slab of pure gold that was set atop the Ark of the Covenant, and there were cherubim on each side of it, and that was where God was seated. You know, that represented God's presence with the people. 
And if the Ark of the Covenant, which it was taken in battle, they f figured that God wasn't with them anymore. That's that's the kind of power that they uh, said that, that the Ark uh, conveyed. The prophets came along later and said, not only... Uh, not only is God not not in just the Ark of the Covenant, and he's not even just in the temple, but he is in man's hearts. And the prophet said that uh, uh, your heart is, uh, it, it's going to be broken. It's not going to be stone, full of stone anymore, but it's going to be melted down, and you're going to feel the love of God in your life. And that was when Jesus came and told us about God. Um and so it says, God presented uh, him as a mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. So I think he's talking about the Passover. In, uh, you know, you, you've all read about the Passover in, in Egypt when they, uh, the Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. He was holding the Hebrews in slavery. And Moses told him to let his people go, let God's people go. And they wouldn't do it. And so these plagues came about. And the last one was the Passover. That is, uh, the firstborn of all the Egyptians would be killed and the Jews unless you would put the blood on the mantle of your door or, or the lintel of your door. And then the angel of death would pass over. And I think that Paul is alluding to that, that even though we have sin in our lives, even though we don't deserve to be passed over, when we display the blood of Christ in our lives and that we've accepted him into our life as Lord and Savior, then it just means God is going to pass over our sins and treat us with mercy. He's going to treat us not with justice, but with mercy. And Paul says this, uh, to me that's what he's talking about. Verse 26 says, God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. And so we know all about that. We've, you've, you've heard of that ever since you became a Baptist, that, that uh, having faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you. So that's uh, a, a name that was given to God, the, a name that God is our righteousness. God is righteous and he's this new king that's going to come. And we know now that that's Jesus Christ. And so to me, we get hung up with, oh, you know, what's going to happen with the Jewish nation? What's going to happen with this? Well, to me, that's really kind of irrelevant. And I know to a lot of people uh, that's that's really important because we know that if we stand up for Israel, supposedly that um, that God will stand up with us. But but God's covenant has passed from the Jewish people to the Christians. Now, I'm not saying that Jewish people uh, can't be saved uh, if, if you believe that you have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then they can't be saved unless they accept Christ in their life as Lord and Savior. So who are God's chosen people? Is it the Jews? No, it's the Christians. Where are his chosen people now? It can be the Jews. That's fine if you're a Jew. But, you know, and if you become a Christian, then, you, then you'll be saved. But it's not a one-way covenant that God says, I'll take care of you and sin and bring you to heaven with me forever, no matter how you act or no, no matter what you do. Already have faith in me, already you hate me, um, you know, you can come and be with me. No, that's, that's not the deal. The deal is, I'll take care of you if you believe in me. And he sent Jesus Christ to help us have an understanding of God and to believe in him. And if we do, then you're, you're a Christian and you will be saved. Uh, whatever happens to the Jewish uh, people, you, you know, that that's between them and God and Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to make any judgments on that. I don't know what kind of provisions God will make for them in their lives. But all I know is that as we read today in, in the gospel, in, the, in Romans, uh, that in order to be saved, you accept Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. Um, and, and that's it. And we, we accept that covenant that God has given us because he is a righteous God and goes beyond righteous because he is a just God and goes beyond that because he is a God full of mercy. Now, let's just kind of sum up a few of the things here that we talked about. Um, probably see most of that. So we see here, first of all, that, that God acts. God is the one that acts. And when I, when I read this in the very beginning, uh, in, uh, 
in Jeremiah, it says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will raise up a righteous branch. So God is, is the one that's doing the acting. We didn't go to God and ask for salvation. God came to us and offered it to us. Uh, number two, God is righteous. And we talked about that enough to know that God is righteous. And in fact, he is more than righteous because if he was just righteous, then we would all be in trouble. But he supersedes being righteous and he is full of mercy and grace and allows us to live lives forever and ever to be with him. And then sinners do not receive justice. We talked about that. We don't receive justice. We don't even receive righteousness from God. We receive his mercy. And that's what saves us, his mercy period. And then lastly, grace over the law. And that's what Paul said. He said, you know, first of all, he told us about how bad we were. See, that's the very last one down there. Uh, he told us uh, how bad we were and, and, and that nobody deserved to go to heaven and that we were all corrupt and we were all sinners, etc. And then he says, but now let me tell you what God has told us, what the scriptures tell us, what Jesus taught. He says, grace is over the law. God's grace is over the law. Um, no longer do you have to keep the Ten Commandments in order to get to heaven, but you will keep the Ten Commandments because you're a Christian, period. Um, you know, Jesus said the greatest commandments, he says, narrow it down to two. He said, is to love God above all things, love your neighbors yourself. Um, and he said, if you do that, you'll keep all the rest of them. You keep those two and you'll do all the rest. You'll keep all the ten. So, God wants you to have a positive outlook to your Christian faith. Okay, that pretty much takes care of it. And I thank you for tuning in today. And next week, we're going to talk about uh, a title of God as our protector, as our protector. So let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for caring about us and for showing us the importance of your love in our lives and the importance of the mercy that you've shown us. For without it, we wouldn't have a chance. We're sorry we sin. We're sorry that we look down upon our brothers and sisters. We're sorry where we scoff at them and cause difficulty. Help us to be better Christians and to bring a community together because people see God's love in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.